Um, so let's uh, start this uh, session on the how to build uh, patterns and practices for how to build uh, resilient uh, service applications. And I think a good place to start is probably just to define uh, what do I mean when I say resiliency. And if you look at the Oxford Dictionary, the definition for resiliency is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties or toughness. And notice that this definition doesn't say that it's about preventing failures, but it's rather resilience is about being able to recover from them. And that's an important distinction to make because as uh, Werner Wogel, um, the CTO for Amazon, often said that everything fails all the time. So you can't prevent failure. It's not something that you can act, that's within your ability to do. It's outside of your control. But what you can do is build applications that can withstand failures and continue to operate even when they happen. So in the data center uh, that Amazon or Google or Microsoft is operating, you can bet that hardware failure happens all the time. The servers just suddenly dies or a particular rack would suddenly die. You can't, one of the things you learn really early on when you're building stuff on AWS, on EC2 and so on, is that, uh, well, if you want something to stay up, you can't just run your application on one server because when that one server dies, uh, your application dies. And then uh, you run, the, and, then, and then you decide to, okay, um, that means we need to run our application in, on multiple servers, uh, potentially spreading out across multiple data centers, because it turns out other things that are outside of your control, like natural disasters or power surge, or even I think one time there was a shark that ate, that was, uh, that bite into a cable, under underwater cable that connects different data centers together in within AWS. Uh, that caused a connect well, network issue that happened in one of the AWS regions. Turns out entire data centers can go down even when you're running the cloud. So you want to run your application across multiple availability zones or therefore data centers as well as multiple regions within AWS. And then when you look at it on the sort of more individual um, on sort of individual servers, you've got a bunch of resources that's available to handle requests that's coming in. You've got CPU, you've got memory as well. And of course, uh, more requests coming in and hitting the same server means that you're going to use more of the available resources you have to handle them. And what you typically see is that, well, everything is kind of getting slightly slower as you hit, as, as you get more and more traffic until you hit this certain point. This is what we call saturation point whereby the latency for those uh, requests is just gonna spike up. You just go up really, really quickly because uh, your CPU, your resources are now being overloaded and you're not able to effectively process those requests. And of course, requests are still gonna keep coming in. So you're building up a larger and larger backlog. And so your overall latency just keeps going up very, very quickly. And this happens uh, on, the on the sort of individual servers and um, Unfortunately, as we're building more and more complex distributed systems nowadays, you, what you often find is a, a, a user would uh, talk to a, an, an API, a user-facing API, and that API would call some other API, some other service to get some information, which oftentimes have to call another service. It could be one of your own services. It could be one of Amazon's services that they operate, such as DynamDB or S3. And if one of these other services uh, that's further down the core chain is having a problem, is having some kind of outage or a uh, elevated uh, latency, then those problems can often propagate back so that uh, it, the services that, no, that are not handling those, uh, pro uh, those uh, failures properly, uh, they will end up having errors and then uh, and, then, and then return an error response to their caller and then eventually get all the way back to the customer, which gets like an error pop-up in the app. And of course, uh, that just doesn't, it's not very good user experience. So that really starts to hurt your users. Uh, and of, of course, nowadays, uh, there's so much competition in terms of uh, the tensions that your customers have, then it's very likely that your customer will just go to somebody else. And when you look at, the sort of systems that uh, we kind of use every day, your Twitter, your Netflix, and so on, they are just getting more and more and more complex. So this, uh, these are what you call microservice uh, dev stars. And this was uh, circa, what, well, from 2015. So uh, I bet all of these systems are now are far more complex than what you see on a screen nowadays, uh, on, on, when you see on a screen now. 
And of course, when it comes to building systems uh, in a very uh, in a res resilient way, it means that these guys have to invest a lot of effort into making the applications uh, uh, resilient to all kinds of different failures that they, they can observe in production. So I guess a quick introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Yen Chui. I'm an AWS Serverless Hero, and I've been building systems on AWS for over 10 years now uh, across different industries from uh, from uh, e-commerce uh, to social networks to gaming and so on. And uh, one of the things I've done, I guess, in the past with uh, serverless uh, and was moving a social network to run pretty much entirely on serverless in about 2016. And the last couple of years, I've primarily focused on working with serverless technologies within AWS. And nowadays, I spend half my time working with Lumigo as a developer advocate, trying to improve the state of uh, serverless availability and Lumigo is a I would say troubleshooting platform for serverless applications that make it really easy for you to debug issues that happen within your serverless application even when it spans across all kinds of different things such as API Gateway, EventBridge, Kinesis, SNS and so on. We try to make it easy for you to see everything that's happening within one transaction so that you can work out where the problem is. The other half of my time, I spend working as an independent consultant, working with uh, clients all around the world, helping them adopt serverless and AWS uh, successfully through training, through consulting, and sometimes uh, working with clients to actually deliver an MVP. So, uh, so going back to the whole topic of uh, resilience, uh, that's, I re I'd like to point you to this uh, diagram that's, uh, that was originally drawn by Uri um, Fred. Fredrickson, I'm pretty sure I just murdered his name. Um, but uh, uh, so this kind of shows you the four broad categories of things that we should think about when it comes to thinking about resiliency. You know, from the high level architecture side of things, so you want to build systems that are uh, loosely coupled so that uh, they have their fit individual microservices that should be self contained so that if one starts failing, it shouldn't have to, it shouldn't have an impact on others so that you bring down every other service as well. So this is where the I guess uh, if you have a distributed monolith uh, whereby you've got lots of different services or share the same database, then you don't really have that self-containment whereby you have a single point of failure when it comes to, oh, if the database is having a problem, all of your services is going to go down. And then you've got isolation in terms of bulkheads. So oftentimes you think about uh, account level isolation, uh, could be running different applications, uh, different services on different AWS accounts, which you have some built in isolation in terms of uh, breach, uh, security breach, in terms of uh, some of the service limits and so on. But also, even lower level in terms of uh, building your applications. So, if you're running a, uh, say, um, a Java application, uh, maybe so you can apply some ideas around uh, okay, we can bulkhead certain threads within the thread pool so that uh, one particular process can't eat up all the available threads on the server which end up causing a downtime and so when it comes to lambda you have uh, you have you have a much better resilience, I would say, uh, out of the box. Uh, for one, you've got some isolation already out of the box, where every Lambda function would uh, have multiple uh, containers. Each one of them would run only one request at a time. So you had you, so within one request, you have this isolated execution environment where you are not going to cause problems on other requests that are also happening concurrently. And equally, every function, every, you know, functions are isolated from each other as well. To some ex to a very large extent, you do have some regional limit that you have to think about, which we're gonna uh, we're gonna get onto in a minute. And then the thing you get out of the box with Lambda is the fact that you get them, uh, you get multi AZ. So um, one function, when you deploy, uh, it gets deployed to three different availability zones out of the box. And the same applies to many other services that AWS offers, such as API Gateway, uh, DynamDB, and so on. So you get all of this uh, multi AZ out of the box. And the great thing is that for services like API Gateway and Lambda, when you don't use them, you don't pay for them. So even though you're getting all this extra redundancy out of the box, you don't end up paying for them when you're not using those services. And so this is you know, this is one of the often pain points of having a really uh, resilient application that you have to run on EC2 or on containers, whereby for every extra level of redundancy with uh, multiple uh, availability zones, you are paying more and more for those uh, idle resources that are, you're not using when there's no request happening uh, against those uh, different regions. 
And then uh, there's, when it comes to a request coming in, uh, AWS handles all the load balancing, so you don't have to build some load balancer yourself that sits across all of the different availability zones. And in terms of having a multi-region setup, uh, you can also uh, use the DynamoDB global tables, uh, which are going to get onto that in a minute, uh, so that you can make it really easy for you to build a multi-region active active uh, uh, application. However, as I mentioned just now, that you do have some regional limits you've got to think about. In fact, every layer of this very common setup, I would say, when it comes to building a serverless application, where you have API Gateway, you have Lambda, you have DynamoDB, all of those, all of these services have some throttling. So you can get throttled the API gateway, you can get throttled the Lambda layer uh, level, you can get uh, throttled on DynamDB as well. And in terms of the sort of different timeouts, you guys also got to think about the fact that uh, different services have got different timeout limits. So for API gateway, you have uh, integration timeout for 29 seconds, but Lambda function can run for 15 minutes. So if you had configured your Lambda timeout to be greater than 29 seconds, then that means that even if your function is still running, API Gateway would have timed out the request after just 29 seconds. Equally, you've got uh, um, SQS queues, which has got a maximum of a a 12 hours for visibility timeout, which is uh, the amount of time the SQS will hide the message after it's been received by one of your processes and, uh, and before it's uh, made available to another uh, process uh, for reprocessing. But your Lambda function would have time out after five, uh, 15 minutes. And the general recommendation from AWS is that you should set the visibility timeout to be about six times of your Lambda timeout. So if you are setting your Lambda function timeout to be, say, 30 seconds, then uh, that means you should set the visibility timeout for the SQS queue to be six sec uh, 30 seconds times six, uh, which is going to be three minutes. And uh, one of the nice, uh, one of the common sort of practices or, or, or pattern when it comes to, well, uh, we've got this API and it's going to do some pretty heavy computation uh, and API gateway is going to time out after 29 seconds. And we're not sure uh, that all the computation is going to be done within that 29 seconds. So one of the patterns for sort of mitigating this particular risk is, uh, well, instead of doing the work straight away and what we can do is uh, especially in the case of a file forget uh, what we can do is so uh, we can accept the request from the caller and then we're gonna instead of uh, actually doing it in the function itself we're gonna just put into a queue and then have the queue have the uh, sqs queue be uh, trigger a lambda function to then process them in the background which in this case can take up to 15 minutes and uh, we don't really care because it's happening behind the scenes and then you can also set up a delta queue. So in fact, whenever you are using um, SQS with Lamb, was, well, whenever you're using SQS, you should be setting, you should have a delta queue as well, so that uh, if there's persistent problems with uh, particular messages, like a poison message that you can't process, doesn't matter how many times you retry, then uh, they don't just keep on re uh, using resources within your system. And instead, after a few retries, uh, they get, they're going to get captured by the uh, delta queue. Uh, so in this particular setup, uh, you can then you can then um, um, you can then absorb all kind of, uh, well downstream problems much better because you don't have to worry about you know, failing and then uh, uh, returning a five uh, five or two to the caller because now you're processing stuff in the background. Uh, so you have a lot a lot more flexibility in terms of how do you handle uh, those kind of downstream problems. However. Even when you do have a delta queue set up, um, you do, you know, and then uh, maybe something is happening. So it could be a case where you are talking to a third party service and it just so happened that they're having an outage. And you, know, you just keep on retrying your those failed messages, but they're still having a problem. And that may take, I don't know, half an hour or an hour for them to resolve, by which time a lot of your messages would have gone into the delta queue because it's exhausted the total number of uh, retries. So now you've got alert uh, and then you look at the data queue and see, okay, I've got a bunch of messages. So now I figured that, okay, it was related to this out downstream system having an outage, but what can I do to recover? So I need to have some way to replay those events, maybe put them back into the main SQS queue to reprocess now that the downstream system has come back live. 
So how do I go about doing that? Um, this is quite a common problem that people run into. In fact, I've run into this quite a few times. So I built a set of tools uh, broadly under this uh, thing called the Lumigo CLI, uh, CLI command tool. And one of the commands that's available in the CLI tool is for you to replay uh, messages from as SQS delta queue and then uh, put it back into another uh, um, uh, SQS queue or SNS topic or Kinesis stream. Uh, and you can even put them into a different region so or in a different account altogether uh, so this is where potentially you want to open you want to try out first in a say like a dev account uh, before you replay them and in this case you have a separate uh, toggle they can use to say okay please keep the messages after you re re uh, you replay them because we want to just replay it in a dev environment to make sure that uh, uh, maybe it's a problem with our code that we actually fix the problem before we put it back into the main queue in production and then you end up failing again. So this approach, this very simple pattern is uh, it's very effective, uh, especially for those uh, find and forget tasks that you receive from uh, like a post command, for example. Um, but what happens if um, the caller is actually waiting for response? I mean, we can't just know send the stuff uh, to the queue and then process them in the background while some user is still waiting for response on the, on the, in the ui uh, because again we are bound by that 29 seconds timeout on api gateway so very similar and uh, i guess related pattern uh, which you uh, which i think uh, i think is called the decouple invocations uh, based on where i uh, I, uh, I just saw it being formalized in the soa patterns book uh, whereby okay you've got an api that accepts this request to do some work uh, the call is is expecting a response but it's going to take you know, a bit of time so what you can do is again you're going to push up, put it into the queue to do it uh, to process them in the background but instead of uh, just returning nothing, you return a 202 with a header, that a location header that says, okay, when the result is ready, it's gonna be at this location. So now the client can pull at that location uh, from time to time to see, um, is the result ready yet? Is the result ready yet? And every time while the result is still not ready, they're gonna get 202 back. And then again, just location header again. And once the work is actually being done by the background process, then the next time the, the client polls, they're gonna get a 200 okay. And then they're gonna get the actual response from the, the work that's been produced by the background worker. So if you walk, walk, uh, if you walk through how this may look like, uh, so here we've got API gateway, we've got Lambda. When a request comes in, uh, we're going to put some metadata into a uh, DynamoDB table to say, okay, this is the request when it was created and the current result is no. And in the meantime, we're also going to put a message into a SQS queue and then we're going to respond to the caller with a 202 with the location header. So now with that, we've put the message into SQS queue. It's going to call a Lambda function and the Lambda function is going to be doing stuff in the background. And in the meantime, if the caller Pings the location um, and see is the result ready. We're going to see in the DAM DB table that nope, not ready, not ready yet. Uh, so we're going to return a 202 and then the work is done. The background Lambda function is then going to update the record and so set the response, so set the result in the DAM DB table. So the next time someone, the client calls, uh, we can see, oh, the result is there. Great. We're going to return that result to you in a 200 response. Um, so this works quite nicely, uh, but wait, there's still some problems, uh, or at least the things that I don't really like about this. Uh, firstly, uh, we've got a distributed transaction here. So anytime you have, uh, say, a Lambda function having to do multiple things within one request handling code, you have a distributed transaction on your system. So in this case, uh, if, uh, say, we first write the data into DynamDB and then we put a message into the SQS queue, well, what if the put to SQS fails? What do we do then? Do we just let it fail? And then we end up uh, with a message that's sitting in the DAM DB table that can never be completed because we never managed to queue up the task. Um, or, or do we have to do some rollback and then delete the data from DAM DB? Ideally, you would need to do that. Uh, however, what if uh, we are also running a pretty high scale and pretty close to DAM DB's uh, provision throughput? And then when we try to rollback, that fails for some reason. And then our function gets timed out after six seconds or three seconds. Uh, what happens then? We're going to end up with some phantom data. So 
when it comes to actually handling distributed transactions properly, you need to do to do it well and do it properly. Uh, you're probably going to have to end up implementing some kind of a saga pattern, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But for now, one of the things that uh, I guess one of the patterns for getting away, getting sort of working around the fact that you need distributed transactions here is to just use DynamDB streams. So instead of having the first function doing both writing to DynamDB and queuing up the task in SQS, you can have another Lambda function listen to the stream from the from the DynamDB table and then say, okay, right, when someone uh, updates, when someone inserts a new task, I'm going to turn that into a message and put it into SQS instead. So that way you don't have a distributed transaction anymore because it's all been sort of linearized, uh, it's been sequentialized instead. And instead of, and also instead of uh, putting something from from the table into a queue through the stream, maybe you can just have the function do the work day and then. And uh, one of the interesting things you get with uh, these uh, streams as event source uh, that includes both DynamDB streams as well as Kinesis streams is that you get this uh, retry and to success behavior, which is quite interesting. It's got some interesting implications and use cases. Um, so for example, the fact that you can you can get, you can well, your Kinesis streams at least, you can control how many uh, concurrent executions are happening at the same time using the number of shards. But even without that, the fact that you get retry and to success. So if uh, DynamDB streams cause your function and your function errors for whatever reason, because the downstream system you depend on is having an outage, then your function errors. So the so DynamDB streams, DynamDB streams is going to call your function again the next time with the same batch. And you're going to do this over and over until you either process it successfully or until the data has expired from the stream. So that means when the, the failure mode here is that my downstream system is going to have an outage, they're going to have some problem, then, well, the retry to success just means that we're going to keep on retrying until eventually the downstream comes back, in which case we're going to be processing at the maximum throughput as dictated by the number of shards that you have in the Kinesis or DynamDB streams. And so one thing to keep in mind here is the how long the data is going to be retained for. With Kinesis streams, you can extend that to up to seven days. With DynamDB streams, you can't extend the default 24 hours retention, which means, well, this is all well and good and normal workday because you can't expect if something's happening, then it should be resolved within 24 hours. Uh, but for weekends, that might be a bit more tricky. So it may be that, okay, uh, we don't have people on call or um, there's a problem, but no one noticed until Monday. And then by that time, a lot of data may have been lost already. So what you need to do is, what you need to make sure you here is that you need to have good alerting in place so that when there is a problem, a persistent problem, that you get alerted quickly so that someone will go and uh, address that problem. Maybe it's going to be a case of um, using the new features in the uh, for stream processing we're going to talk about in a minute uh, so that we set up a delta queue so that after a certain number of retries, those events get put into a delta queue instead. And also we have to worry about this fact that, okay, um, what happens if uh, there's just like a problem with one message? Maybe the format or the data is wrong uh, and then we just can't process it. Every time we try, it just fails. Again, this is something we're going to have to deal with uh, uh, when it comes to you know, the fact that it's keep on retrying and to success. So a single poison message can essentially, essentially render your whole system unresponsive because it's going to keep on retrying this poison message without being the process, uh, process it and properly, and then it's going to not able to move on to the next message. So again, both things, we are, there are solutions to address this. But first, let's go back and talk about the fact that, okay, what if sometimes you just do need to have a distributed transaction, you just can't work away your, your way around it anymore. So this is where you kind of uh, want to introduce the saga pattern, which is a pattern for managing failures where within a distributed system where every action has the equal and opposite compensating action for rolling it back. So if you want to learn more about the Saka pattern, uh, you can go and read and watch this uh, YouTube video afterwards. The link is yeah, through this link here. Um, 
The example that the Katie McCaffrey used in her talk there is a, a, a travel example where someone want to go on a holiday, which unfortunately none of us can now at, a, at the moment, where you have to have this transaction where you book a hotel, you book a flight, you book some car rental, and every single one of the steps can be modeled as uh, lambda functions, as well as uh, order every single cancellation step as well, to cancel the hotel, to cancel the flight, and so on. And to have that, uh, and then for our saga pattern, we need some kind of an orchestrator or coordinator that the hand that so, um, controls when do we execute the sort of the next uh, step in the in the transaction and then when do we execute the, the fallback logic so we can use the step functions for that uh, and the step functions is great for orchestrating workflows with uh, lambda functions so suppose the input here for our workflow is uh, we want to book a trip from uh, London to Dublin and here's the you know, details for the trip in the happy path we will book the hotel, that's a seated. So we book the flight, that's a seated. And then we book the rental, and that's a seated. So we complete the whole transaction happily. In the failure case where we try to book the hotel, it failed for some reason, then we need to apply a rollback to cancel any sort of changes, any state changes that we've made so far uh, for this uh, booking. And then we're gonna, by, we're gonna execute the cancel hotel step uh, to do that. And then we're gonna, we're gonna fail the transaction. Equally, when we book the hotel, that's a seated, but then when it comes to booking a flight that failed for some reason, then we need to first cancel the flight as the uh, rollback, and then we're gonna cancel the hotel as well, so that uh, we don't leave any sort of half complete the transactions in the in, in the system somewhere, and then we're gonna fail the, um, the uh, fail the whole transaction. So going back to the poison message, uh, the fact that the retry to success has got its benefits, but also the downside as well in terms of uh, having, having to deal with uh, poison messages. So really luckily at the reInvent last year, uh, Amazon announced a bunch of new options for managing this uh, retry behavior you have uh, for uh, Kinesis and DynamDB streams uh, with Lambda, whereby you can configure this uh, on failure destination. Essentially, this is your DLTQ support for Kinesis and DynamDB streams uh, for Lambda, where you can say after the maximum retry attempts, which the default is 10,000 and this probably is way, way excess excessive for anyone's needs, I think. So I typically go with a retry attempt of a three or five, um, which is giving every message a reasonable chance to succeed. But if it still fails, then, then what you can also do uh, is this is very this is quite nice is uh, you can enable this split batch on error. The fact that Kinesis and DynamDB streams are batched event source for, uh, for Lambda means that you're gonna get a batch of say I don't know 100 messages, uh, maybe uh, sorry or 10 messages, and only one of them was a problem. Rather than you know taking all six and then put them into a data the queue, uh, you can instead use this so that when you get that first batch of six and the errored, the next time DynamDB calls your function, it's gonna split the batch in half and it's gonna give you the first half, which is three messages. If it failed again, you're gonna split the batch again and then this time it's gonna give you the first message. And if that first message is the problem, then you're gonna keep failing on that first message and then after the maximum number of uh, um, after the maximum number of uh, retry attempts you configure here, then that single message is going to be put into the delta queue. So using this uh, split batch on error option, you can converge on the single the, the, the poison message very very quickly. But the fact that the retry attempts uh, only count <coughs> when we're talking about um, just exactly the same batch. So when we go from six to three to one to one to one, only the only the one the, the batch of one those count as the same batch. So the retry attempts only counts those, which means that overall you're gonna have some of those messages uh, be processed multiple times anyway. So you still have to think about item potency when it comes to dealing with these uh, particular partial uh, partial failures. Um, and also, uh, when you when you eventually did identify the poison message, uh, it ends up in your data queue, and um, the data queue is gonna the, the message is gonna look something like this. The key thing to note here is that you don't actually get the message body. Instead, you get information about where to find that uh, uh, that message based on the shard ID, the sequence number as well. 
And so you have to actually make a call to DynamoDB streams or to Kinesis streams to actually then fetch the message body in this case. And remember, they only gonna, they're only going to be in the stream uh, for say 24 hours for DynamoDB streams or up to seven days if you opt, if you opt for extended the retention and pay for it on the Kinesis stream. So you do still need to have the alerting in place so that you can do this proactively before the data gets uh, expired from the stream before you had a chance to actually fetch it. Um, <coughs> And whenever you're doing any kind of, sort of background processing, you always have to worry about, okay, what if there are more messages messages coming in than I'm able to process, especially when the failure case here is that, oh, you know, we have to talk to some uh, third party system. And uh, normally they respond within you know, five milliseconds. And now suddenly they respond every request uh, in hundred milliseconds. So now we are processing messages slower. It's not necessarily causing errors per se, but it's slowing us down. That means that our backlog is getting bigger and bigger. I mean, we are not able to process messages fast enough to keep up with the rate of them of more message coming in. So this is where you can use this uh, maximum age of record configuration. To say, uh, well, when we are when we're really overwhelmed by the amount of messages and we just can't keep up anymore, then what we can and oftentimes uh, you find is that uh, well, if the messages uh, doesn't uh, is not completed within a certain amount of time, the client or the user will just try again. So when they try again, the new message would uh, you, you can just drop the old message and then uh, prioritize the newer messages that's going to have a better chance to succeed here. Uh, and so those older messages that you're shedding, so this is low shedding we're talking about, is going to get put in to the data queue. So you can still go back and retry them later if you want to. But in the meantime, you're able to then process fresh messages that uh, when the user or the, or the app just retries out automatically, hopefully you catch those work, those uh, new messages that are, I guess, duplicates or retries of the original message. And then when it comes to load shedding, uh, another thing you could do uh, is, uh, well, what, ha what happens if we're doing this low shedding, but then we're putting stuff into the data queue and then we are, you know, still want to process them automatically, the, uh, but we don't want to process it at the same time right, straight away because uh, that's just going to create even more traffic that is, that's already causing us a problem. So whatever's happening with the downstream system, we're going to give them more traffic so that they're going to have even worse latency numbers or have more errors. So what you can do on those data queue if you want to process them automatically is add this uh, delivery uh, delay so that um, you don't process them right away. Instead, you're going to process them with a slight delay. <coughs> uh, and when it comes to SQS, you also have to think about a slightly different, I guess, a partial failure case as well. Uh, because when it comes to SQS and Lambda, your function is SQS is still a polling based service, except uh, when it's when you use it as an event source for your Lambda function, AWS is running this polar for you, is polling SQS on your behalf and then calling your function when there are messages. Uh, and then when your function completes successfully, then as the, the polar layer is going to call SQS to delete the message on your behalf. Now, what's going to be, what's going to happen if your function errors? Again, you get a batch of say 10 messages from SQS. One of them is a problem and you couldn't process it. So even though nine of the messages were able to, when it was processed successfully, one of them failed. That means uh, the polar is not going to delete all 10 of them. So all 10 of them is going to get retried, potentially in different batches, uh, different sort of batches to what it was originally. But in this case, ultimately that sort of poison message is still going to be retried multiple times. You are still going to fail every time, and then it's going to be captured and then dropped into the data queue, uh, which is great. But it's still a problem that the whole batch is now failing as a unit. So you are, you know, those nine messages that was fine and processed already is going to get processed again. So you have to think about item potency, which can sometimes, you well, know, it can be as, as simple as using conditional checks uh, when you're doing using uh, DynamDB so that uh, uh, you only update the record if um, you know, the, the field, if a particular field or version number, whatever field you're using uh, is uh, the previous, is the previous version. Um, However, uh, that's not always the case, especially when you're calling third-party services. So there's no other way to really version them or you know, bring uh, make it item potent. So I've discussed a couple of different approaches you can, okay, you can take here with SQS and Lambda, um, including 
just use a batch size of one. The simplest approach you can take, uh, however, uh, you know, it's just, it's just, there's no partial failure when the, the, the batch size is one, right? Uh, however, this can hurt your throughput and add to your cost as well because uh, you can, you're can you going to need more invocations to process the same amount of messages. Um, and then the second option is to make sure that you have item potency. Uh, again, much easier said than done. Sometimes it's as you know, easy as using conditional checks, but then oftentimes it's not. Um, so my preferred approach is that, uh, okay, so if that's not an like option, then what we can do is we're going to process all 10 of them, uh, but then we're going to have a try cache around every single message. And then we're going to just catch and return um, the failure response uh, for every single message so that at the end of the 10 messages, uh, which is the maximum batch size you can have for SQS anyway, you're going to see, okay, which all the messages failed. And for the ones that failed, uh, we're going we're gonna to leave them. But the ones that succeeded, we, we want to make sure that they are deleted. So what we're going to do is we're going to call SQS ourselves from the Lambda function to delete the messages that were successfully processed only in the case where there was a partial failure. So now we've deleted the successful, uh, successful messages so they won't get retried. And then what we can do is then we can just throw the error. Cause a function to error so you have some marker in your logging system to show, okay, um, one time this function uh, uh, errored. Uh, and then now those messages that failed would be retried with the same sort of mechanism that the SQS Polar, the fact that they didn't call delete on the batch uh, for you, so they're going to get retried later. But in this case, the ones that succeeded the first time around uh, would have been deleted by you uh, from your function. Another quite common, I guess, failure mode we're going to think about is the is what we call a retry storm. So imagine lots of functions are talking to some service and that service is under some pressure. So it starts to error, start to time out. Uh, so those Lambda functions, if you're using uh, HTTP clients or using AWCK, uh, um, AWCK itself has got built-in retry. So all these concurrent executions for your function are going to retry. As well as newer invocations, they're all going to try the same. They're going to you know, do their first request. Um, again, systems have those uh, that service having problems, so some of these requests is going to fail, and they're going to retry again. And then, alongside the the, the next lot of uh, uh, the next lot of uh, con uh, concurrent executions, they're all going to try the same thing. So you're just constantly exacerbating this same the, the problem that you already have uh, against this uh, uh, service A. So eventually, that service is just going to crash and burn. And this is what we call a retry storm, where you've got the retries. You got so when a system is having problems, is have to handle the new requests as well as a retry from the previous request. And if those retries fail, sometimes you can retry it again from the same request while you have the second retry from the second batch, and then the new request and so on. So a, a really good uh, a pattern for okay, protecting against these kind of problems uh, is to have a circuit breaker pattern, whereby you say, you know what. We're going to make a couple of requests um, to, to this service. And if this service at any moment in time fails, say, five consecutively, uh, five times consecutively uh, with timeouts or whatever, uh, or other errors, we just gonna, we're going to trip the circuit. And so while the circuit is open, the next time we're going to try to talk to the service, uh, we're just going to fail. We're going to fail straight away without even hitting the service. But every couple of minutes or every now and then, we're going to allow one request to go through. And if that request was successful, that means the system has recovered and we close the circuit and everything returns to normal. There's different libraries for implementing this logic uh, in different languages uh, for Node.js. Uh, you've got this thing called uh, a Possum, uh, which implements this logic. But when it comes to Lambda, a big question that you, know, you often have to ask is, uh, well, that means we need to have some state, right? We need to know the state of the circuit. Where do I keep that? If I know the simplest thing to do that is to just just put it in memory as your uh, of your of the lambda function. But a given lambda function can have many 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 concurrent executions. Every single one of them has got their own memory. And if you're putting stuff into global space uh, in, as a global variable, whatever, well. With Lambda, you've got to remember that the containers are retried and anything that's outside of the handle of the function itself, anything that you declare as a global variables or as a environment variables, they're going to get reused, they're going to get persisted between invocations for that same container. 
So if you're putting stuff in memory, keeping the state in memory, then they are going to persist between invocations. And so if uh, you are starting to see failures and you're tripping the circuit, then the, that's fine. Then for that particular container, once they made a decision to trip to open a circuit, then the next time that container runs, it's not going to try to talk to the service. So using the sort of in-memory state is very simple. Uh, that's really not much you have to do. A lot of the libraries already do this for you. And uh, also the good thing is that there's no dependency on some external service to keep track of state, which you're going to have to... So for every service that you're talking to, you're probably going to want to have a circuit breaker to protect against that so that uh, in the case of uh, prob fa uh, problems, failures, you don't just keep hitting that same service over and over. So if you're using a database to keep the state uh, the, sh uh, the state for the circuit, then again, guess what? You're going to need to have something to protect that database as well. And also there's additional cost and maintenance in terms of the infrastructure, uh, keeping things running when you don't use them potentially. Uh, and also managing permissions and so on as well. Now, the downside of this approach is that it's going to take you longer to converge on a decision that, oh, this service is having a problem, we shouldn't be talking to you at the moment. And uh, all the, since every container have to make a local decision to, to reach that decision, so they need to hit the service multiple times to, uh, and have to fail a certain number of times before they each reach a decision that, oh, that service is having a problem, let's not talk to you anymore. And when you've got, say, a traffic spike and more containers show, uh, came up, then the, well, guess what? They all have to each reach the same decision as well to not hit the service because that service is having problems. So all of this means that you are generating more requests uh, to the downstream system uh, in order to reach the consensus for in, in order for each con um, distributed cons each, uh, each concurrent execution to reach the decision to open its own circuit. The other option is uh, we can use some external service, and this could be as simple as a DB table. So that uh, this table will just keep track of the state of the circuit, which right now is closed. But then after a few of the concurrent executions start to see errors, uh, then they will report those errors to the database. Uh, and then if we see, okay, within say like a five minute window, we've seen 10 different timeouts from different concurrent executions, then we're gonna trip the circuit. Now the circuit is gonna be open. And next time, uh, individual contain, uh, um, concurrent executions sees an error, it's going to check, oh, is the circuit open now? Should I just stop making requests to the service? And then they can all find out from this uh, uh, um, centralized uh, location uh, whether or not the, the circuit is open or not. In terms of pros and cons, it's basically the opposite of uh, what we just, uh, just discussed. Uh, the pros being that you minimize the number of total number of requests you have to make uh, to trip, uh, you have to make to the service to trip the circuit. And then uh, when you have new containers that comes up, um, they can also just ask the database to see, okay, down DB table to see is the, is the circuit open right now before you even have to make a request to the service that's having problems. The downside is that more complexity in terms of the code, but also in terms of the provisioning of the resources, infrastructure, and the IEM and so on. And now you've got another dependency that potentially also requires um, protection uh, through using circuit breakers. Imagine if uh, so many things are talking to this database, uh, this time DB table, that that becomes the thing that fails, and that's the kind of thing that you need to have a circuit breaker around to protect. In terms of uh, which approach uh, you should use, um, I would say it probably depends on how complex a solution you have and also uh, how much you care about just having slightly more requests hitting the service before you can reach the consensus that uh, that service is having problems and how spiky your traffic is. But I'll tend to sort of go with, uh, start with the simplest solution for now, uh, just at least at, at first and just use the in-memory option. And if that you find, okay, that's just not clever enough. Um, when it's something does happen, it makes too many requests to the downstream system. Then the, at that point, uh, maybe investigate uh, seeing whether or not you can use uh, another um, database to, to be, become like a centralized place to track this, uh, this state. Another thing you gotta think about when it comes to Lambda, is how the auto scaling behavior works. So Lambda auto scales based on traffic. So if you call a function, you no, know, it's gonna, and there's no container available, um, then Lambda is gonna create a new container, load your code, execute the request, and you just auto scales based on uh, based on traffic within some limit. So you have, firstly, you've got a regional concurrency limit, which for most regions uh, starts with 1,000. That's a soft limit. So you can raise that to tens of thousands. Uh, that's no problem with that. However, 
there is a harder limit, which is how quickly you're able to create new containers across the whole regions for all of your Lambda functions. And for most regions, again, that limit is uh, 3,000. So that means that if you need to have a peak capacity of, say, 10,000 concurrent executions, you can go from 0 to 3,000 straight away in most regions. Again, in most regions, not all regions, but in most of the bigger regions, you can go from 0 to 3,000. Uh, what happens then? You need to hit uh, 10,000. So that uh, from then on, you can only go up, excuse me, by 500 new containers per minute, which means to reach a peak capacity of uh, 10,000 concurrent executions within the region, it's going to take you, let's see, uh, 3,000 right away. And that means uh, 7,000 at uh, 500 uh, per minute, which means it's going to take you 14 minutes. Uh, so in total, it's going to take you 15 minutes to get to 10,000 concurrent executions. So for some of the traffic, uh, it's it's probably okay uh, because uh, you know you don't have that spiky traffic that's you know, that spiky. However, you can. <coughs> so so this is uh, basically saying say so I'm showing how the uh, the burst capacity limits uh, once uh, you have um, uh, goes over. What you can do is you can use the new feature, the provision concurrency, to say, you know what, uh, I know I'm going to need ten thousand in you know in a bit, so I'm just going to ask for it now. And provision concurrency behind the scenes is going to create those containers ahead of time, so that when you do need that ten thousand capacity, it's going to be there already. Uh, however, you're still bound by the same limits of uh, three thousand and five hundred per minute. So if you know you're going to need a capacity of uh, ten thousand concurrent executions then you have to give yourself at least 15 minutes before you need that 10,000 so that there's enough time for provision concurrency to, to do its thing, to provision con uh, those um, those actual uh, containers uh, at, at and while respecting the sort of 3,000 uh, burst limit and then 500 per minute, so that it's going to take like 15 minutes to get to the capacity you need. And then with uh, provision concurrency, and the nice thing about it is that uh, you can do auto scaling. You can configure that with application auto scaling uh, scaler, so that um, as as you so use more and more of your provision concurrency, you can also auto scale uh, the total number of provision concurrency as well. And it also works sort of side by side with the on demand concurrency. So if there's more requests than your provision concurrency is able to handle, then it just lambda just gonna create containers on demand for you. So here's a, I guess again a quick view of the uh, of the of the limits we talked about the 15 minutes and the fact that you've got a concurrent regional concurrency limit of 1,000 by default that you can increase with a support ticket, but then there's the so the the limit of uh, uh, 3,000 burst initial burst limit and then 500 per minute, uh, which just means that lambda is great for spiky traffic up to a certain point. However, in practice, you oftentimes are not going to hit any of these limits because uh, containers are reused. And if your function returns very quickly, that means uh, if the average execution time for a function is, say, uh, 30 milliseconds, because all you're doing is turning to down DB, uh, then what's, what's going to happen is that that same Lambda function, the same Lambda container, can handle over 30 requests per second. So you no know, one say uh, well that basically one uh, one second divided by thirty milliseconds you get thirty three requests per second, which means uh, even when you've got a thousand requests per second, chances are you're only gonna need what uh, um, uh, thirty concurrent executions to handle that peak throughput. But still, there are systems that are just you know far more you know, has got traffic that are a lot more spikier than that. Uh, it could be a case of e-commerce uh, for uh, Amazon and so on, where on Black Friday or big uh, sales days uh, you can have very very spiky traffic. Uh, it could be Netflix when they launch a new show, or my previous company, The Zone. We do live uh, sports streaming, and uh, what we see is uh, you know, when there's a match is about to start, you, you know we got we got concurrent users going from you know, maybe 200 to 1.2 million within 30 seconds because everybody locks on like 30 seconds before the match starts <laughs> it's just human behavior so in that case we can use the auto scaling built-in auto scaling with a provision concurrency to say well we know when it's gonna we're gonna need it but we know and also we know that the uh, burst the, the burst limit uh, still applies here so we're gonna ask for the peak capacity that we know we're gonna need say 20 minutes or 30 minutes before we need it so that there's enough time for us to ramp up to that total concurrent execution that we're gonna need when the spike suddenly comes and again 
when we miss uh, when we uh, undercalculated, then it's fine. It should be fine because uh, extra um, request which is going to be handled by on demand concurrency in this case. So that's all well and good for those uh, predictable spikes. What about if you have unpredictable spike, uh, like when the um, the early days uh, of Instagram, when Jennifer Aniston joined them and uh, her first post uh, took down the platform? Because again, a lot of these systems like social network, you don't control what the users do. And when you've got a major influence um, doing something on a platform, that can create a lot of un uh, unpredictable spikes. In that case, if uh, your scaling problem is really with Lambda and uh, the scaling limit, that's, uh, scaling limit that's, that's in place for Lambda, then well, you can also just get rid of it. With API Gateway, API Gateway can actually talk to a lot of different AWS services directly without having to go through Lambda. So if all you're doing, your API always, always doing is uh, uh, putting something into SQS queue, then you can also just have API Gateway do that for you using a service called uh, using a uh, using this uh, thing called uh, service proxies, uh, which you can read about here in this blog post I wrote a while back. Uh, and if you're using something like the service framework, there's also a very nice plugin that makes it really easy for you to configure those connections from API Gateway to say SQS, SNS, uh, Kinesis, and so on. Um, so I saw briefly touched on this uh, at the start that uh, this whole multi-region active active, which is kind of the gold standard when it comes to building a really resilient uh, service applications. So in this case, uh, imagine you have a REST API uh, with API Gateway, Lambda, uh, DynamDB, all running in one region. And they're all sitting behind uh, Route 53 with some you know, friendly, user-friendly um, domain like api.myapp.com or something like that. Um, this is already quite resilient because you got multi-AZ out of the box. But you still are vulnerable to region-wide failures so that uh, if the whole region is having a problem and uh, sometimes you do have those networking issues that happens uh, to an entire region, then what you can do is that uh, you can deploy your application, the same application, exactly as it is, to three separate regions, and then you can serve requests from all three regions all the time in an active, active setup using Route 53 to route traffic to uh, different regions based on probably using some kind of latency based routing so that user in the US would be routed to US East 1 uh, or US East, uh, or in the so East part of US would be routed to US East 1. Uh, on the West Coast, they'd be routed to US West 1, and anyone else from Europe would be routed to EU West 1. In this case, uh, you can still make sure that people can access data that are created by other users in other regions by making sure that all of your DynamDB tables, which again is a regional service, right? Uh, but you can link them, you can synchronize them using global tables, which basically is Amazon doing the data synchronization across multiple regional tables on your behalf. So in this case, if one of the regions is having a problem, you can enable health checks uh, with, with these three records so that when that region is down, that region is, uh, the traffic is no longer routed, routed to that region and instead to be distributed to the EU West 1 and the US West 1 uh, regions. <clears throat> so that even when there are regional problems, systems still just works automatically, traffic will be diverted to the, the other regions automatically without you having to do so extra things yourself. And the same approach can be applied to data processing pipelines. Uh, it's not just limited to APIs. So for example, if you've got say uh, two upstream SNS topics, uh, you know, again, active, active, so that everything goes to, uh, every, uh, US East one has got its own topic and EU Central one has got its own topic. In this case, you have a queue and then some Lambda function, and then you know, that propagates some data into a DynamDB, which is then used to support some API you've got, uh, which is why you've got these two, sort of, uh, two different directions of arrows in this case. So in my single region, US East 1, I will subscribe to the topic um, on in both US East 1 and EU Central 1, so that if one of the regions goes down from the upstream system, the whole pipeline still just works without having to do anything, any sort of manual intervention. So the fact that the system just continue to work stably without have to, you know, us having to do any sort of manual intervention is what Amazon engineers would call um, static stability using, well, availability zones, which again, you can read more about uh, in this, uh, uh, in, in this uh, article I've linked here. 
So this is basically how Amazon approaches the building resilient systems that are that has got a static stability uh, when certain regions or availability zones are having is having problems. But in this case, uh, in this setup, you are you end up ingesting the same data twice, once from the different topics in different uh, regions. So you do have to do some dedupe in your system, which could be again using uh, conditional updates uh, in the DAM DB, uh, so that you don't write the same data twice into your DAM DB table. Uh, but if you want to take this uh, take your data processing pipeline and make it a uh, multi-region as well then you just again just deploy the same thing in a separate region again now your queue in each of the regions is have to subscribe to both of the upstream regions uh, as well again and do dedupe and then your done db table uh, is going to be configured as a global table so that again amazon is doing the data replication across the different regional tables for you and in this case, uh, if one of the regions goes down, your central one goes down, then all of your data posts and pipelines in both regions are still working because they can just end up consuming data for, uh, updates from the US East one regions uh, and uh, SNS topic. And for the API layer, we already talked about how you can use uh, Wolf 3 to sort of uh, to route traffic to across different regions. So if you know if uh, the problem is not with your application, uh, it's not with the your system that's not publishing data to the SNU West EU Central One region, but it's totally the problem is with um, with AWS that the whole EU Central One region is out for some reason, then doesn't matter. Your system is still working because from the data ingestion side of things, well. The, U, uh, the US East one uh, region is still working and is list is getting updates from the uh, upstream SNS topic from the US East one region and the API is still working because with this three will just be routing all requests that was going to the EU Central one region now all of them to the US East one region so that you can you know the system will still be working and have a static uh, uh, stability. But as you go into this uh, world of uh, multi-region architecture, um, there are things to keep in mind. Is the, uh, in that uh, it's while it's great, it protects you against a uh, uh, lot of uh, you know regional failures, which doesn't happen very often. But when it do, they are fairly high impact. Uh, but at the same time, they do create a lot of additional complexities for you in terms of both how you write application, the fact that you need to do dedupe, the fact that you need to provision the same SIF, the same thing to different regions, which means uh, CI CD becomes a little bit more complicated, especially when you want to roll out updates. Um, do you update all regions at the same time so that potentially if something goes wrong, you're gonna up, you're gonna impact all the different users in all the different regions, and also it just becomes harder for you to test. You know, especially with this more and more distributed and complex systems it becomes quite difficult to test them and so the best way we have for testing these really complex systems is uh, chaos engineering which is something that maybe you have heard about uh, from the likes of uh, netflix or amazon you know from how they talk about you know, killing servers in production environments at random to simulate uh, infrastructure failures like uh, that often results in the loss of uh, ec2 servers and see how whether or not the system can still stay up uh, when those infrastructure problems happen it's certainly like killing servers is certainly one way you can apply the principles of chaos engineering in practice but chaos engineering itself is actually much broader so in the words of uh, principles of chaos.org uh, which is one of the best places you can go to actually read and learn about chaos engineering and really understand its core principles it defines the uh, chaos engineering as a discipline of experimenting on a system in order to build confidence in the system's capability to withstand turbulent conditions in production and notice that it doesn't talk about killing servers it talks about a discipline of experimenting on a system in order to build confidence right and it's becoming increasingly important to you know companies all around the world because we're just building more and more complex systems uh, which have more complex and hard to predict the failure modes and the thing about failure is that you know, as we talked about at the start they happen all the time be it hardware failures or software failures and you can't choose when they happen that they choose you they just decide to happen when when they when they want to and all you can do is choose how prepared you want to be when they do happen so that you can so that your system so they can build applications that are resilient and can still stay up when those failures does happen 
and the goal of chaos engineering is to identify weaknesses in our system before they manifest into system-wide aberrant behaviors because we fail to identify this uh, systematic uh, uh, systemic weaknesses early and we do this by using controlled experiments to learn about how our systems actually behave when failure conditions happen. In the same way that we write tests for our business logic, we also need to write tests uh, for our system's robustness and resilience against different turbulent conditions that is going to face in production eventually. And the two, pri the two primary ways we can actually do this is through either organizing events like uh, game days where, uh, for example, a bunch of you may gather together as a team and then one of you will decide, uh, you know what, I'm going to turn off networking on one of the servers and then I'm going to see how quickly you guys are able to identify the problem uh, to, to see whether or not we have sufficient monitoring and uh, diagnostic in place so that people can identify problems that they didn't know about beforehand uh, and then you know, work out a solution for those uh, problems. Or we can do it sort of more programmatically and in sort of automatic way to inject failures into our system to see how it actually handles them. Uh, and, and since you want to, and you want to do these experiments in a controlled fashion so that the experiment itself doesn't just spiral out of control accidentally and actually cause an outage in production and affect your users. And there's lots of different ways you can actually do this uh, to keep a lid on the experiment and keep it under control. We're going to talk about that in a minute, uh, and it's a very important topic when it comes to chaos engineering. But first, the four steps you can take to start doing some chaos experiments yourself. Step one, you have to know what normal looks like for your system. If everything is on fire all the time, then you don't have a steady state and you need to get your house in order first and establish what normal working condition looks like. For example, you may say uh, normal working condition, uh, under normal working condition, the 99 percentile latency should be below 500 milliseconds. And there should be less than say, uh, 1% of uh, HTTP errors uh, per hour or per five minutes. And then once you know what normal looks like, then you can start to hypothesize or theorize uh, what would happen if something was to go wrong. For example, uh, if one of the servers in the cluster dies, or what if uh, DynamoDB starts acting up and the latency starts going from a few milliseconds to hundreds of milliseconds. And then you can inject realistic failures into the system to simulate those uh, failure conditions that you want to test. Remember, you want to keep them realistic. It's really easy to get carried away with uh, once you start doing these experiments to hypothesize all kinds of scenarios that's just highly, highly unlikely. We I mean, start with the low-hanging fruits. The simple errors <coughs> oftentimes uh, are going to give you the, um, the highest return on investment. And finally, after you run the experiment, go through the data to look for evidence to support uh, or to disprove your hypothesis uh, by looking at the metrics, the logs, the x-ray traces, and as well as any other forms of telemetry that you're collecting to look for evidence that your hypothesis about how your system would behave is actually correct and true. And I can't say this enough, that if you're starting out, do this in a dev or staging environment. You can learn an awful lot from just running experiments in those environments. You don't want to go anywhere near your production environment until you are absolutely confident that whatever you know, weaknesses are you are injecting um, is actually being handled by the system because you've done this so many times in the dev environment and in the staging environment. Think of it as uh, if we were to perform, I don't know, uh, martial arts on stage. Would you do that before you have you know, practiced the same moves uh, hundreds of times uh, in the gym in the or in front of the mirror and instead of you know, just go straight on the stage the first time you try something? You wouldn't, right? And remember, the goal here is not to actually break production. Is to The goal is to identify weaknesses before they actually happen. And uh, if you, well, and not to actually cause an outage that uh, puts you on the 
front page of a newspaper because your experiment has gone wrong and uh, you took down your system, you know, your service by accident. Uh, be incredibly humiliating and uh, quite embarrassing and probably rightly so as well because common sense would have told you to you know practice this in a low risk environment first before you start and you know you go and start killing things in production when you have just no idea what's going to happen but despite the risk you need to understand that the problems that you do find with all these experiments they're not caused by chaos engineering the experiment just reveals weaknesses that you already have in the system. And what the experiments have done is reveal them to you before bad things actually happen. So you can, you still have time to prepare for them. The, but there are still risks involved, uh, even when you are just experimenting in a non-production environment, as you can probably still accidentally break your dev or staging environment, and that can have impact on your colleagues who depend on these environments to work. So you do still need to have a, a, a containment measures in place. Firstly, you want to make sure that you run experiments during office hours so that uh, people are in the office and they can deal with any unintentional consequences quickly to minimize their impact. Uh, you also want to make sure that you over communicate if need be to be very transparent. Tell people what you're doing, when you're going to do them so that nobody should be surprised that suddenly they see some errors coming from your service because you're running some experiment without telling anyone. And also, if there are any important business days coming up, uh, make sure you avoid them. So if your business is uh, like the zone streaming live sports, then the, don't do anything before or during the event. You just apply common sense and don't take any unnecessary risks. And when you do make a change, when you do need to make a change, uh, make the smallest change you can. So, in, so when it comes to injecting failures, for example, uh, inject failures to one API endpoint at a time. And uh, if you're going to do this in like a shared environment, then uh, do this to one request at a time. And lastly, uh, have a rollback plan ready so that before you even start, so that in case, you know, Bad things happen, you didn't anticipate uh, how the system behaves and how it fails and uh, before things escalate uh, too much, you just stop the experiment quickly and roll back whatever changes you've made. And I cannot say this enough, um, do, not, do not start in the production. You can learn an awful lot from those lower environments and by the time an experiment graduates to production, you should be very, very confident that a system is actually going to handle it. And you're only going to get that level of confidence because you have practiced this hundreds of times in those lower environments already. And the great thing about chaos engineering is that it's not limited to, to, it's not limited to just your application. It can be applied to test your infrastructure, the platform itself, as well as the sort of people and processes that you have in place in your organization, uh, using things like a game days to see whether or not when something does happen, you know, are your people well trained and well drilled to actually look for the, the right information to figure out what the problem was. In terms of tooling, you probably heard about Netflix's uh, Simian Army, where you have a bunch of different monkeys for killing servers, for injecting latency, for killing an entire availability zone, or even a whole AWS region. And then there's also tools that allow you to run, I guess, the Chaos Monkey logic uh, through a Lambda function uh, so that you don't have to run a server just to be able to occasionally kill other servers. But no, working with mostly serverless technologies, so the question that I want to ask is, uh, well, how do we then you know, apply the same principles to testing our serverless application itself? Because, I mean, we don't have access to the servers anymore, right? The servers that are running our code are managed and run by AWS and hosted within their own VPC. So I can't just log on to the server and I can't you know, kill it remotely. The good news is that, well, when you're using managed services like AWS Lambda, API Gateway, and so on, AWS is already doing all sorts of experiments to make sure that the Lambda service itself, as well as the infrastructure beneath it, they're all highly resilient. So as a customer, I don't really have to worry about individual servers dying or you know, uh, sporadic uh, hardware failures, but I'm still responsible for my own application code, and I can use chaos experiments to identify weaknesses inside my application. For example, uh, maybe I've misconfigured my timeout so that um, some user-facing API is going to timeout 
if the internal API calls uh, has got longer timeout than it does. So I'm calling you know, for my API service A, I'm calling service B, and service B has got longer timeout. So my you know, caller is going to timeout first, which doesn't make sense here, right? Or maybe I'm missing some error handling, which is a very incredibly basic mistake to make and also incredibly common in practice. And in cases where a downstream system is having some outage, uh, maybe I'm also just missing a trick here by not having some fallback strategy in place so that I can return either some cached or some default response so that I can, so that I can mitigate a cascade of failure here. Uh, so Gunnar, uh, who is also a serverless hero, um, he published a very helpful library uh, that allows me to inject failures into a Lambda function. And I want to show you some examples of uh, how this can look like in practice. Uh, for example, what's going to happen to our application if, say, uh, DynamDB is having an elevated uh, error rate? Well, we hypothesize that given the fact that the, the ABSDK itself has got the built-in retries, then everything should be just fine. So let's see what happens if that is, is uh, indeed the case. Uh, so I want to switch uh, quickly to a demo app. Uh, in the meantime, I just want to see if we've got any... Okay, we've got a bunch of questions here. Uh, let me get back to the questions uh, in a minute, uh, but for now, uh, I want to show you that. So this I've got, this is a demo app here, uh, and uh, let me just see. Go. So here, so this is the actual code behind it. Let me make it a bit bigger so it's easier for you to see. So it's a very simple a uh, project using the server framework. You've got a like, get index function that's doing some um, server side rendering, and then uh, you've got some permissions to call uh, some restaurant API endpoint to get some to return the restaurants you see here. So when I load this uh, landing page, uh, this hits the get index function here, and then this uh, API this this function calls another endpoint to actually get the list of restaurants that you see on the page here. And then that's uh, that's a that's the endpoint. That's the function that supports the endpoint uh, endpoint that returns the restaurants. So very very basic. But what I want to show you is that um, this using that library that Gunnar provided. So if open up again. Go to package JSON. So the library is called the failure lambda. It's a library for Node.js, but I think he, and for Lambda functions. But I think it's also got libraries for Azure functions as well. Uh, so what this thing does is um, within my say get index function, I have to require the failure lambda uh, module and then I use it to wrap my handler code around. So that's it. And then uh, I have to say for this function, uh, provide a parameter that points to a parameter in SSM parameter store. So if I go down here, you can see the definition for that, uh, which is something that uh, is going to put into SSM parameter store. And it's going to look like this. So by default, <coughs> it's been disabled. And um, you can inject uh, various different kinds of failures. Uh, so in this case, what we're going to do is uh, let's simulate what happens to our application if, say, the get restaurants function, the one that returns the list of restaurants behind and uh, restaurants endpoint. If the, that's the one that talks to DynamDB to this uh, restaurants table. So what happens? If uh, DynamDB is uh, are we not able to connect to DynamDB, so I can do what I can do is I can go to SSM parameter store, uh, go to make make this a bit bigger as well. Okay, that's big enough. I think. Go to the configuration. I have for get restaurants function, and I'm gonna say uh, the failure mode is to blacklist uh, uh, S3 and DynamDB. Okay, great. So I'm going to edit this and I'm going to enable it. Let's save. So now if I go back to the landing page, if I refresh, remember the hypothesis is that there's built-in retries, right? So it should just work. Um, indeed it does. And that's because I think I've deployed the branch that's already got the thing yeah, oops, uh, hold on, let me. So I already deployed a branch with the fix that's uh, more resilient. So let me, hold on, 
we deploy this. And in the meantime, let's uh, see if there's any questions while we do this. Uh, okay, we've got a question from uh, Sarab. Uh, how much max memory we can use in Lambda? So the max memory is uh, 3 gig. Uh, and uh, when you allocate more than 1.8 gig of memory, uh, you also use a second. You can also get a second CPU core as well. However, when you're using languages like Node.js, um, which is single-threaded, uh, you can't really take much advantage of that. Um, and uh, yeah, Nitin already answered that. Uh, but for languages, uh, other languages like Java, .NET Core, uh, oops, oh, to force. Uh, other languages like .NET Core, uh, you can actually or Go, you can actually access the second CPU core uh, once you allocate the one more than 1.8 gig of memory. And the amount of uh, CPU you get, as well as the amount of network bandwidth you get, is also uh, relative uh, to the amount of memory allocated to your function as well. Uh, again, depending on what your function is doing, uh, if you all your function is doing is talking to DB, then more CPU is not going to help you because uh, you just you know you're going to be waiting for I/O anyway. Uh, got a question here. Hi, how can we use? Well, how can we have different versions of Lambda to be promoted from Dev, UAT, and production? Um, so, using the server framework, for example, uh, you can see you've got the stage. So, when you look at the functions that are deployed in the actual AWS console, so what I would say is that uh, using tools like using tools as server framework and other frameworks, they kind of do this for you. Uh, if I've got different uh, stages, they will have different, they actually deploy different versions, different functions altogether. One of the problem you find with uh, the fact that with Lambda, even though you do have versions, so if I go into one of these guys, and I can see in terms of quantifiers, I do have different versions. However, uh, all of the different functions should end up with the same IAM role. So if I change my code to require new, uh, that requires more IAM permission or less IAM permissions, then that's going to be a problem for me. If um, the, the same IAM permissions are going to be you know, used across different um, versions, still deploying. Uh, and uh, so typically with the server framework, you can say SRS deploy, and then you can say I want to deploy to uh, dash dash stage or just the dash s uh, staging instead by default it's going to use the dev stage and then if i want to go to production i'll do this and of course i have i'll have different uh, im profiles uh, which uh, if you use the lumigo cli uh, we also have a command that allows you to easily switch between different profiles uh, so for example i've got a bunch of different profiles i use for different you know, projects and so on i can also use the lumigo cli uh, I mean, whilst we wait for the deployment to work, I can also use the Lumigo CLI to help me right size the memory function, the memory allocation for my function by using uh, PowerTune Lambda and say the region, uh, say US is one and the name of the function. I've got a test function called the Python test. So what this is going to do is say it's going to, oops, strategy. So this basically executes different uh, memory settings for my function to see which uh, memory setting gives the best say in this case uh, different strategies either cost speed or balanced most of the time you want to go with balanced so when i do this what it's going to do is uh, it's going to deploy this thing uh, that's created by uh, alex casponi lambda power tuning uh, lambda power tuning i think ah there you go so Alex Casaboni, who works for AWS now, he's got this uh, tool that allows you to basically run different uh, memory allocations for your function and figure out what's the best memory allocation for you. Uh, so when I do this, so after running that particular function, it tells me that the best memory allocation for my function, given that I'm looking for a balanced profile between speed and cost, is 256 meg. And I can say yes. And that's going to show me a diagram of um, how the performance changes uh, over different memory allocations and how the cost changes as, as well. So in this case, you can see that by going from 128 uh, default to 256 meg, um, uh, well, sorry, by going from 128, uh, not a default, default for the server framework is uh, one gig to 256, I can get a lot of performance improvement, but not so much change in cost. So that's why it recommends that as the best balance. Whereas uh, if I go with the default, 
then the, the session no benefits, even though I'm going to be paying four times uh, the cost per 100 milliseconds of execution time, um, I don't get any benefits from actual memory. Okay, so that's a nice bit of sidetrack. Uh, while I deploy the others, okay, so that's done. So let me. Okay, so this version does, doesn't have uh, the fix. Uh, it's timing out, even though AWS CK has got supposedly retries. Um, so let's look at the logs for this uh, get restaurants function that we just uh, invoked. So look at the latest logs, and uh, you can see that we intercepted network uh, network connection to DB. So even though, as you can see, there's multiple attempts from the function because uh, it's making multiple attempts uh, from the SDK. When there's a persistent connection, uh, persistent problem, the function still errors. So let's uh, go back. So the result from that particular experiment is that uh, our function still timed out after six seconds, and somehow our hypothesis was uh, disproved. Um, so what we learned was that uh, you saw there's about a total of 10 different attempts. So the Amazon's uh, Dime DB uh, SDK client uh, has, uh, for JavaScript at least, uh, defaults to 10 retries with a base uh, exponential de uh, backoff delay that starts with uh, 15 milliseconds. And that delay between every retry is calculated using this particular formula, uh, which Mark Brooker, who is the senior principal engineer at the AWS, uh, he you know he kind of confessed at the re-event last year that this is uh, this is his favorite uh, formula of all time. Uh, so what that means is that if you put them into a you know maths to work out what's the maximum possible delay after every retry, you can see that very quickly just the delay between retries alone can push you over the six seconds if you have a couple of uh, throttle exception. In this case, uh, we had quite a few, we had more than uh, um, uh, uh, like more than five, I think. Um, so what can we do here? Uh, well, one of the things we could do is uh, we can just override the default configuration and set a more reasonable max retry uh, count for our functions. Excuse me. Uh, and then we can also add the fallback. So for reads, we can fall back to previously cache the responses uh, or some static default response uh, for writes. We can queue up the write to a SQSQ or something like that so that uh, it gets retried in the background, similar to what we saw earlier in terms of uh, what if you've got a find and forget a pattern um, a request from the, from the caller. So let's again, let's see how we are, I will fix this. So I've got actually a, a branch that uh, addresses this particular problem, this particular weakness. So now, whereas before, uh, let me switch it back so they can see the before. So before the get restaurants function looks like this, where <clears throat> you just call the get restaurants, uh, which just get it from down DB, uh, do a scan, which you shouldn't do, <laughs> but just this is just a demo. So it's just, all it's, it's doing is this, uh, the DimeDB SDK itself um, has got a retry. So it's doing, in this case, a retry many times. Uh, this time, I think, what was it? Four, so they did a total of nine retries attempts. And towards the end, you can see it was uh, the, the time between each of retries are very short before. And then as you get towards uh, later on, uh, the, the gap becomes a bit bigger. And so in any case, before all the retries are, ex are exhausted, our function has the timed out after six seconds. So in this case, what can we do to make this better? Uh, let me just uh, quickly or switch over to the other branch. So um, to make this better, what we can do is uh, we're still going to call DB. We're still going to use the SDK to call scan. Uh, but what we're also going to do is uh, we're going to just remember the last response, just going to cache it uh, for future sake in case uh, we couldn't talk to DimeDB, somehow we lose access to connections with DimeDB. So, and this, uh, as I mentioned earlier, anything that you declare that's outside of the handler function itself, 
these are going to stick around on the same container. And I can also override the default max retries and turn into three. So after three retries, for some reason, it's still failing, then don't even bother anymore. So in my code here, I'll say get restaurants. But if um, after maximum three, maximum retries, we're going to come down here, we're going to get into the catch block, and we're going to see, oh, you know, maximum number of retries has been, exist, uh, has been exceeded. So if we have a you know, response cache, because we had a previous response, good response, we're just going to return that. Even if there's newer data, it doesn't matter. If return, uh, if there's, you know, there, are, there are persistent problems, returning something is better than returning nothing. Otherwise, we also have some default set of response that we have configured uh, down here, which is default set, which in this case returns four rather than uh, uh, eight restaurants or eight restaurants we had earlier. So let's uh, deploy this. And whilst this is uh, happening very slowly for some reason, uh, I'm gonna probably because I'm running streaming and uh, uh, video recording as uh, and also the bandwidth is having getting a taking a hit. So let me just answer a few more questions. What happens if an individual service goes down but other services are up? Dynamic DB is down, but if a gateway is up and running, exactly is what we're trying to do here. So uh, what we're kind of trying to simulate is that if Dynamic DB is having a problem, but everything else is still working, so how can we keep the system running? Uh, one of the things we can do is to just do simple things like having uh, um, having some cache responses and having some default response. So one good example you probably have heard in the past is, uh, so um, Netflix, for example, in the very early days of Netflix, if, um, so when, when you go to the homepage for Netflix, uh, they try to load your profile uh, and then give you your personalized list of uh, videos uh, or films you should watch. But if there's anything going on, uh, you know, if there's any problems along that call chain, then uh, you just get 500 and the, the, the website just crashes. So they very early on they realized that's just not a very good user experience so what they did was in that case well they basically applied the same approach uh, they have some cache for previous responses uh, for for, uh, for you so if they can't talk to the profile service or whatever the service they called it um, they return a cache response uh, if failing that they don't have any cache response for you then they just return a default set of uh, films that they know everyone is able to watch uh, I think from if I remember correctly from a previous talk they did uh, it's like films from the 1980s because all the copyright uh, uh, has expired on those so that uh, they don't have to worry about uh, showing you movies that you may not be able to you may not be allowed to watch in your country and things like that so that's um, so that's basically the similar approach that the Netflix does as well. They've actually done a lot of work. Um, I think they probably moved on from that now. But now, uh, so but on the Netflix, they used to have this uh, library called uh, Hysterix, which uh, has got this uh, sort of fallback pattern back into everything they do. So every command they do has got a fallback, uh, which could be coming, you know, getting data from the cache. And if that still fails, then the fallback would be, you know, they will bake some default response. So in this case, uh, we've deployed our, our app. Let's make sure that it's still working. Okay, so now this is returning a default set because we don't have any cache response and because we have this guy set to true. So we're not able to talk to DynamoDB, but we're still able to respond something because we have some default response that's baked into the system. Uh, so let's see what happens if we Disable this. Uh, maybe let me just uh, touch this function. Just uh, another thing to keep in mind is that uh, whenever you change the functions uh, environment variables, it essentially causes the uh, it counts as a well, it counts as a deployment R two. So now we've got a fresh container. The next time we run, uh, there's no errors. Fresh container is going to run. It's got uh, all the data back from the restaurant's API. So it's got a cache. Uh, so now if we go back to the SSM primary store and we turn on the failure injection, save it. Look, notice I took a bit longer, uh, but it still returned all, everything. So let's look at the logs for this uh, get restaurants function. 
look at the latest one here. So the first time we ran, I got all eight restaurants from the DamDB table. Second time we run, after three retries, uh, because we uh, we blocked the network connection to DamDB, so it says max retries exceeded, uh, exceeded executing fallbacks and we returned the cache response. So even when we not, uh, we're not able to talk to DamDB, the system is still working in this case, which I hope also answers your question as well. Uh, so let's uh, go back to the slides. So the outcome of all doing all of this uh, is that uh, we end up with a more resilient system, which is uh, what we're looking for here, even though our code becomes a bit more complicated. Um, all right, so let's uh, do one more demo, one more example, and then uh, we can try to go answer more questions you have. So in this case, uh, well, what if we were depending on a service and the service itself has got an elevated uh, latency? So in this case, we've got the get index, we've got the, uh, the get index function doing the service rendering and it's talking to another API endpoint uh, to get the list of restaurants. What happens if the list the restaurants endpoint is having elevated latency? Well, okay, so suppose we have a try catch uh, around that. So we ship it and handle it uh, around those API calls. So Again, we can you know, bake in some default responses and so on. So let's see what actually happens in this case. Uh, so let me go back to a version of the code that didn't have my fix. So if you look at the get index function, uh, it's calling the get restaurants function, uh, and then uh, it's just you know, doing some well, I call it service rendering. It's not really a uh, proper service rendering. I'm just using mustache to uh, uh, put a few restaurant stuff in there. Um, but in any case, there's no uh, there's no error handling here. But even if we do put some error handling, I still wonder what's going to happen in this case if, uh, say, the get restaurants function have uh, such a timeout. So one of the things you can also do with um, the let me just copy the syntax, copy it here. So let me see. So I wonder what happens if, uh, so by the way, I forgot to mention, the rate is a basic percentage from zero to one. So you can have, uh, in this case, I'm saying 100% of the time, please inject error, but you can also, uh, if you're gonna be doing something on a sort of like a shared environment where you don't want to take down the whole environment, um, then you want to be dialing this down so that uh, it doesn't happen for every single request. So if I go back to the get restaurants function, so configuration, And just change the uh, change the failure mode all the way up here. So instead, if the failure mode is to inject some latency, so this injects latency to the whole function itself. So imagine if I just make the function really slow, as um, for make it down up to. So now, so now the uh, the get restaurants function should be very slow. So if I load this again, which you see in the logs, okay, that timed out. And that's probably because we injected some latency. In this case, we injected six seconds of latency and caused this get restaurants endpoint to timeout. Uh, which causes the function uh, the function that that's doing the service uh, rendering to uh, to time out as well, and uh, which returns the service uh, internal server error. So the question is now, okay, that's obviously not good uh, user experience. So what can we do about this? Um, so one of the things that you note you 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 learn quickly is that. Um, API Gateway has got uh, integration timeout of 29 seconds. Uh, if you're using serverless framework or SAM, uh, it's going to use the default timeout for your function, uh, which is going to be set to like three or six seconds. Uh, but most HTTP clients itself has got a default timeout of 60 seconds. So before the HTTP client times out the HTTP request, your function is going to have timed out long before that, and even and the API Gateway would have timed out before that as well. So what we can do is that we can set some timeouts for the HTTP requests, right? Uh, but the tricky question is, uh, well, what timeout value you should use? 
I've seen two strategies to doing this. One is uh, if you take a function that has uh, six seconds of timeout, you can divide it equally across uh, the different API calls it's making. So if this function is making three different API calls, then every request gets two seconds. Seems pretty fair. However, as you can see in this particular case here, even though overall we should have had enough time to execute all three requests, because one of them was slower than two seconds, we end up timing out the HTTP request and then failing the, the potentially the whole API uh, uh, function, the like Lambda invocation. So we're not giving this request the best chance to succeed. Uh, another approach uh, that I've seen that's more optimistic is, uh, well, if uh, the function has got six seconds, uh, we're going to assume that most of the requests are going to be you know, quick. So we're going to use, uh, we're going to give every single request, say, five seconds. That should be enough. Uh, so long, you no, know, one of them doesn't take that long. So in this case, even though none of them was uh, longer than five seconds, but together, they're all a bit slower over, uh, you know, especially which is, which is quite likely, especially if you're making multiple requests to the same service. So if you're making three different DynamoDB calls in the same invocation, and the DynamoDB is having some issues and average latency is up, then even though individually each request is not so uh, so slow, it, uh, they get timed out. Um, overall, they still cause your function to time out before you're able to return anything. Uh, luckily for us, when it comes to Lambda, we actually have we can actually find out how much time is left in the current invocation using the context object, which has got a property, uh, sorry, a method called the get uh, t uh, remaining time in minis or something like that, which we're going to see in a minute. So a much better strategy, I think, is to set the HTTP timeout based on how much time is actually left in the current invocation but reserve some time at the end so that you can do any recovery steps you like. For example, uh, locking the timeout event itself, uh, publishing custom metrics, or fetch some you know, cache response from somewhere. That way, every request is given the best chance to succeed. But if they do take longer, they take too long, then we would time them out uh, before they cause the invocation itself to time out, which end up with a 502 to, and going back to the caller and potentially uh, cascade the error. So let's have a look to see how that can be done in code. So I'm going to switch back to VS Code and I'm going to switch over to a branch. Uh, so I'm going to share the the, uh, the, the, the the repo with you guys and the different branches that shows you how you can apply this in your own code as well. So again, we are calling the get restaurants uh, uh, function here to uh, by calling the HTTP endpoint, right? But in this case, we first find out how much time is left in the current invocation by calling this uh, get remaining time in minis and then divide and then minus the amount of time you want to reserve, uh, reserve uh, for uh, reserve or should we reserve time uh, 100 milliseconds. So we're going to Use uh, so uh, in this case, I'm using Bluebird, which uh, is um, a Node.js well, Node JavaScript uh, library that also um, lets you manage uh, promises a bit better. It's, uh, it's got support for timeouts and things like that. So in this case, uh, I'm saying when I made the request to, um, to 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 the restaurant's endpoint, please put a timeout on that. So in this case, the timeout would be whatever time is remaining in the invocation minus the hundred milliseconds. So when that happens. If it's successful, then we're going to set the response cache again. Uh, otherwise, if the error is timeout error, then we're going to check, do we have a cache response already from previous uh, invocations? If so, return that. Otherwise, return the default response, which again, something that we have configured here. So if I was to deploy this guy, I uh, should be able to deploy a bit quicker if I just deploy this particular function. Uh, get index. So let's uh, also maybe uh, let's see what happens uh, when I deploy this. So what I'm expecting here is that uh, since we don't have a response cache, uh, we are gonna just get back the default response we get here, which is the uh, four restaurants. Okay, so while that's happening, I'm uh, going to ask answer another question. 
Uh, hi, what's your suggestion on lightweight Java web frameworks to be used with Lambda other than using Spring? So if you're using Java, you just you don't want to use the web framework at all. So when I'm writing you know, uh, uh, Java functions, I just have the raw uh, uh, Lambda handler. So I wouldn't use the web framework at all. So if you do want to use a web framework, then uh, you're probably going to be looking at, and, and you care about the latency uh, or cold start latency, then the, you probably want to be using provision concurrency to make sure that you have warm containers always available so that uh, your user doesn't see the cold start latency, which is going to be hugely impacted when using a web framework in Java because uh, that's just going to create so much um, classes for the uh, class loader to, to have to load during a cold start. Uh, so now let's see if this works. So even though we are not able to get a response back from the get restaurants function, which uh, let's see if I can get the latest logs. Yeah, the latest logs says uh, injected 28 uh, seconds. So uh, clearly our function, uh, our get index function didn't get a response from the get from the restaurants endpoint because you would have timed out. But because we have that error handling here, even though we don't have a response cache, we still re return the default set of restaurants. So the system is still working, even though in, even in the face of uh, inability to get the data it needs uh, from the restaurant endpoint. Okay, so that's uh, that's how we're doing on time. Okay, we're running slightly, no, uh, slightly over, uh, but uh, uh, almost there. <laughs> So the outcome again, the outcome of all of this is that we end up with a more resilient application, which is again what we're after here. So as a quick recap before I go back and answer more of your questions, uh, remember everything fails all the time, or at least eventually for you. And the point of building a resilient system is not to prevent failures, but rather to build systems that can cope with uh, and recover from failures quickly. And when it comes to Lambda and serverless applications, serverless technologies, you get a lot of resilience out of the box by the fact that you have a multi-AZ out of the box for services like API Gateway and Lambda. Uh, but you do still have to think about timeouts, especially when different services has got different uh, timeout limits. API Gateway has got a hard integration timeout of 29 seconds. Lambda got an implication timeout of uh, 15 minutes. And SQS has got a visibility timeout of a maximum of 12 hours. When you have uh, tasks that are fun to forget, uh, rather than doing everything in the in the Lambda function itself, you can actually just uh, put the work into SQS queue and then process it in the background, which gives you a lot more flexibility in terms of handling and the retrying errors. And then you can also have a delete queue as well, so that if, uh, uh, if after say five retries, so it still fails, then at least you don't lose the event. You capture that in your delta queue. Um, that works well for find and forget cases, but for cases where the customer is still waiting for a caller, is waiting for a response, then you can use a similar pattern called the decoupled invocation, where essentially you can uh, you can uh, you can queue up the task, but then you return to the caller uh, 202 with a location header telling them where to find the result when it's ready. Um, but the problem you often find is that uh, you end up having to have some kind of distributed transaction because you have to save the, the data in DB, but also uh, put the task into SQS queue and to do so, to sort of avoid sometimes often having these uh, distributed transactions, you can use the DB streams to invoke a Lambda function to do the work directly. Uh, keep in mind that with DB streams and the Kinesis streams, you have this retry and to success behavior, which can be good for dealing with uh, cases where say a downstream system is having an outage. So you don't have to do any work essentially uh, to just get used to retry and success until um, the downstream system comes back, then everything returns to normal. However, this uh, retry until success also you know, forces you to think about the poison messages and how to deal with them. And uh, luckily nowadays, uh, there are more options that you can configure uh, with Lambda and uh, DynamDB and, and uh, Kinesis streams on better handling them by configuring a lower retry attempts as well as uh, enabling split uh, batch on error. And in cases where you may end up with uh, un, uh, a, a, a huge amount of backlog that you can't um, you can't keep up with, you can also use the, this configuration to implement the load shedding, so that you can prioritize the newer messages that has got a better chance of succeeding. 
In terms of uh, retry storms, uh, you can use a circuit breaker uh, so that the, when the service is struggling, it's timing out, it's erroring, uh, you don't just keep on piling up on, on, that, on that with more and more requests and retries on that service. Instead, you fail fast. But check every now and then to see if the service is back. And if it's so, close the circuit and uh, things go back to normal. For cases where you can't avoid uh, distribute transactions, you can use the Saga pattern to model your transaction and then to implement the uh, action and every single rollback action as well. And when you're dealing with uh, batched resources uh, like SQS, Kinesis, and DMDB streams, uh, you have to think about partial failures. And for SQS, uh, the best approach I've found is to try catch every single message and then uh, man when there's partial failures, then manually delete the messages that succeeded and then bubble up the error so that uh, you uh, get those uh, failed messages uh, in another retry. It's worth uh, thinking and learning about uh, Lambda's auto scanning behavior and it's also how the provision concurrency works, uh, which can be very useful for dealing with uh, predictable spikes that would have otherwise uh, caused you to run into the burst capacity limit in terms of how quickly you're able to scale up the total number of concurrent executions uh, for your Lambda functions in the region. Uh, we talked about multi-region active active and that's the kind of the gold standard when it comes to building a uh, really resilient service application uh, that can withstand not just availability zone outages but also region-wide outages as well. And then we have talked about uh, chaos engineering. We defined it as a discipline for experimenting on a system in order to build confidence in the system's capability to withstand turbulent conditions in production and how it's more than just infrastructure testing or platform testing. It can be used to stress testing your application as well as the processes and uh, uh, people and practices you have in your organization. And with that, that's kind of everything I do have. Uh, I know it's, we've been going on for quite a long time and I really thank you guys uh, for staying with us. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I spend most of my time working as an independent consultant. So if you want to see how service can help your organization go faster or need some help scaling up uh, or scaling up, uh, uh, scaling up your team, then the, go to the burningmonk.com slash hire me to see uh, what services I offer and how we can work together. And I've also got a bunch of uh, courses that are self-published. You can uh, get some discounts on those courses uh, with this code, uh, which is just for you guys. So don't share them in public. Again, uh, thank you so much for today. And uh, we're going to go back and uh, answer some more of your questions.